Welcome, one and all. I'm glad to see so many fun faces out today. This is an exciting day for the McKee Association on a number of levels. First of which, look at this beautiful facility. I am impressed. It's the first time I've been in this building. This is really beautiful. So we want to thank the uh, Fire and Rescue Department for allowing us to use the uh, facility. I think we're the first ones to do it. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, again, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, as you know, the, the Key Association tries to, on a monthly basis, present to the community one of our community leaders that helps us to understand what's going on in the village where we live and whether or not there are things that we can get involved with to help in the process. So today we are honored to have our village manager, Josue Solomon, to come in and give us a uh, talk about the state of the village, just where we are, where we're trying to go, and how we as citizens can support that process. So again, thank you all for coming, and without further ado, I'm going to, where did Don disappear to, oh, sorry, <laughs> turn it over to Don Hollister, who is uh, the coordinator of our community conversation. So again, thank you for coming, and welcome. Mm -hmm. I assume that's I'm clapping for her. <laughs> Before we uh, put Josue up, how about if we just go quickly around the room, say your name and, uh, well, just your name unless there's something really urgent. <laughs> David Gilney. David Turner. Richard Thoth. Kellyanne Tracy. Peggy Erskine. Krista McGoss. Chris Muter. Christopher Cox. Linda Cox. Jerry Sutton. Sam Eckenrode. Carol Young. Anna Belisari. Nancy Miller. Bill Mitchell. Karen McKee. Mm -hmm. And Paul. Paul Appendroth behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a volunteer fireman in the EMT for 30 years. Yay. <laughs> so when they heard that in the back room, boy, they jumped on it. To come all over. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got a tour of the building. <laughs> <laughs> Which we, we can do informally afterwards. But I'm Don Hollister. And this way, I should be able to rattle off degrees and how many years you've been here. But it's you've been three years? Two, two years of those manager. Two years of those manager. Yeah, and you went to Antioch mind. College. You graduated in 06. 06. And was it EMT also? <laughs> oh, that's right. That was a five I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Mm -hmm. nice. mm -hmm. yeah. In this very building? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you were planning this. Chris Wittinger is one of the trustees that was part of mm -hmm. designing this building. But we'll just well, thank you, Don. You know, one thing you left out about Paul is uh, uh, he was a station manager at Channel 5 for yeah, right. 10 years. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Paul, Paul's wife reminded me this week, she calculated what was the in-kind contribution. <laughs> so, we owe a big debt to Paul, so thank you, Paul, for what you're doing now, what you've done for us. All right, so my plan for today is go over what were our 2020 accomplishments. What do we get done? What do we have planned for 2021? And then have a conversation. I think there are a lot of things that you would see in our 2021 accomplishments. Sorry, 2020 accomplishments and goals for 2021 that merit conversations. Better to think that um, we have different perceptions of how important they may be. Uh, and there are things that we might have missed along the way. So for example, the building department isn't something that we have planned for 2021, but it came up. And we find that, that it's an economic imperative for us to have our own building department. And I'll get to it at the, near the end of the presentation. Um, because there are things I want to talk about, building department, other economic development activities. So, I'll get started. Oh, and, and um, in speaking with Don, last year, we, or was it two years ago? Two years ago. It was actually in February. Anyway, go ahead. 
So the last time I did this presentation, we, we allowed for questions in, uh, during my presentation. And this year we thought that maybe I could run through my presentation in the first 45 minutes and then have a 45 minute uh, dialogue. Does that it's fine. sound good to you all? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll run through my presentation in 45 minutes. All right, accomplishments. What did we get done in 2020? We're breaking out the, our accomplishments by division. Administration, public works, and then several different enterprises. So one of the things that we did in 2020 were we secured $1.8 million for the active transportation plan. Uh, that's going to allow us to resurface the share path that runs along Dayton Street from downtown up to Eden Road. That's a, a, a big piece for us because we see it as key infrastructure. Like the, you know, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to walk down South College, but we redid half of the share path there. For us, if we're not taking care of these things, they become trip hazards, liabilities for us. So we need a budget. Uh, for sidewalk replacements and improvements to these uh, shared paths. So for us, big deal to secure $1.8 million for that active transportation plan, because that's not, you know, where that's money we're getting from the state, not property tax money that we are allocating to this. It allows us to allocate our property tax funds and income tax revenues for other uh, projects. So $1.8 million. Um, COVID hit, that was a took up a lot of energy. We transitioned our operations to a lot of virtual operations. As you know, we provide essential services, water, uh, sewer service, electrical, and just like many municipalities across the country, we were unsure how we can continue to provide that service if we had members of the team set. So uh, shifting our operations included creating teams uh, in the organization. So if an employee became sick, we could limit the infection across the organization. So that was also happening behind the scenes in our public works division and our public safety team. Uh, I feel fortunate that we did not have any cases of COVID within our team, so we were able to uh, do well and continue to provide essential services. We passed a five-year operating renewal levy uh, by a margin of three to one. That's uh, that's your citizens. That shows, demonstrates that our, our citizens believe in what we're doing, believe in the value that we have for our organization. So three to one is a really good margin to pass a five-year five -year operating levy. Um, we did a lot of uh, assessments of our infrastructure, uh, primary, uh, primarily sanitary sewer lines. We did some relining of sanitary sewers, so that's uh, 3,900 feet, and that helped reduce the uh, infiltration and inflow in our sanitary system. And I have a, an update just on sanitary sewer system. We installed public Wi-Fi in the downtown area. We're covering the entire downtown area now. Uh, I did an interview with Channel 7 last week that Handy Odeo uh, was also part of it. Um, we, we did some advocacy against the Senate amendment to ban all community broadband networks. Uh, the Senate, I don't know what uh, Spectrum or the, the uh, cable lobbyists were thinking, but somehow they managed to get an amendment in the state bill, the Senate bill, to ban all community broadband networks, which would not only affect what we're trying to do, but also school networks, the information technology centers. Anything that involves a government public partnership will be, will be uh, banned or eliminated if this passes. We, we don't think it's going to pass. Last uh, week, Lieutenant Governor and the Governor uh, made public statements that they oppose uh, this amendment. But for us, we installed public Wi-Fi in the downtown area. We installed it in the schools and in the library. So this allowed our students, our most vulnerable residents, to have access to internet and uh, continue some form of schooling while not in school. That's a big redundant there with the levy. Um, absolutely, we also were heavily involved in the COVID-19 response, messaging, uh, securing resources, whether there were funds, um, and doing all the public safety uh, interventions that we did, COVID tests, uh, food distributions, uh, all the work that, that we did as a community. Obviously, we couldn't do that on our own. The township, the fire department were part of that. The schools uh, were a critical component of uh, the community foundation. 
Uh, I was telling this story uh, yesterday. I met with Bob in Ohio because we've got some money from Bob in Ohio for this year uh, to expand our, our fiber project. So I said, tell us the story. How did this came to be? How did you come up with public Wi-Fi and what are you doing? He said, well, it happened Friday the 13th. It was March. I don't know if you guys recall this, but March 12th, the governor uh, announces the, the emergency, the public health emergency, and the community leaders, I don't know who was there, there was like 60 people in, this, in the gym. We all convened and said, we've got a crisis. How are we going to deal with it? What do we have to do? So it, it started that Friday the 13th with having the community leaders come together. It was probably not wise to all get in one room and start sharing the but you know, we, we, we made it through. So we, we, we all met in the gym and said, how are we going to deal with this crisis? we got kids to feed, we got people to take care of. And a lot of the things that we were able to execute during the pandemic came out of that meeting. Feeding kids, connecting them to the internet, uh, having a program to check in with every resident um, by neighborhood. So the neighbors program, <coughs> the idea started there as well. So it took a, it took a village. It took a village to get us through it. Team profile. We have 50 employees. This was at the end of the year. Uh, so we've got a, a good diversity for what I think you would expect in a, in a small community in Ohio. Um, that's the breakdown of female and males and ethnicity uh, and residency. There's uh, the residency piece is important to us because we want people that are connected to the community. If they're connected to the community, they're going to care for the community and work hard for their community. I feel fortunate that we have such a dedicated and uh, committed team in our work. I, I don't know if you've seen how, we're, how responsive our team is during crisis. To give you an example, we had strong winds um, last year that took out some power lines and we were under a, a storm advisory. Our team came out during the storm and got our power up and running while the storm was still going on. Last week we had um, uh, big storms come through. We had teams stand by. We called folks up and said, hey, you're on, you're on call. So the minute you get a call, we, we want to reduce the time it takes you to get here. So be ready. And they were ready. Fortunately, we didn't have to call anyone. We didn't have any power outages during the most recent storm, but it shows the commitment that we had. The internet. The internet was a big piece of our strategy last year uh, because it's a problem. I don't think we would have gotten so involved if the internet wasn't such a problem here. It's unreliable by that. It's inconsistent, and the quality of the internet uh, is poor. So we felt obligated to do more around uh, broadband connections so that we can ensure schooling and learning opportunities for our children, uh, health care. As we know, during the pandemic, people avoided their primary doctors and the hospital settings. So it was important to have strong broadband connections so that you could do the telemedicine. Uh, finding a job and teleworking and economic recovery. So I put these slides in there because it's, I've been talking about how we need community broadband. And I'm coming into this conversation five years in because there's been a group of people for the past five years talking about the new broadband community fiber. So it's important that we do it. Spectrum isn't going to do it for us. Certainly at and is not going to do it for us. They have DSL and like dial-up internet in town. So I think if we want to have a meaningful economic recovery and a vibrant economic system, we need to provide better internet services and internet options in the community. The broadband nowadays is like the interstate in the U.S. It allows for communities to connect to different labor markets and supply markets and just being able to sell more, have greater connectivity. So that's what the internet is going to do for us. So big focus on that. We solved it by building out fiber infrastructure. So we put fiber in all the downtown area, we provided the access points. Uh, so this was our phase one. We laid down fiber infrastructure in all of that downtown. So far, we've done uh, three phases of our project. We put fiber infrastructure out to Quarry Street Apartments and Hawthorne Apartments, uh, Gone Park, the wastewater treatment facility. We've laid down fiber uh, to those 
strategic location so that we can then expand further from there. So, uh, I, towards the end of my presentation, I'll talk about that old bribe and Ohio money that we just got. So, uh, planning and zoning. Um, we had a lot of new businesses. So despite the fact being a pandemic, we had new businesses. We had uh, Tux and Red uh, and Wines. We expanded a hair and nail salon to professional office, the Coactive and the Chrome Architect uh, offices, and the Brewery Outdoor Patio on the south side. I understand some of you have been out there and, and enjoyed the, the ambiance. Uh, so all that happened under the, under the pandemic, Home Inc broke ground on the village's first pocket neighborhood just up the street. Um, Iron Table Holdings uh, converted 403 into a three unit apartment and has acquired uh, 314 Dayton Street. Oh, I'm sure you've heard the news. What's happening on Dayton Street? Why is so what's happening on, on uh, Dayton Street? That's big news. So that, that project is coming to Planning Commission in July. It's a great project, so I encourage you to uh, tune in at the next planning commission meeting. Uh, so that work started uh, last year. Um, we had more permits. I think the lumber prices increasing last year was due to a lot of folks adding these additional structures. It's folks working from home, staying home. So we saw a lot more permits for addition structures and home occupations. We completed a comprehensive uh, land use plan, and um, we'll put a reference here if we secure additional grant funding for active transportation. There's a bit of the plan. I'll skip over some of this. If you have questions, please visit our sustainableyellowsprings.com. The, the plan lives on the, on the cloud, it's on the website. And what we wanted to do different uh, with this plan as in previous years, that we wanted available to the public. We want it to be an organic document that if we needed to make updates to sections or components of it, we could and not have to hire a new consultant or hire a local team to update a report that sits on someone's shelf. It's available to the public on the website. You can look through it. And we, we plan to update uh, sections of it as uh, updates are needed. More on the comprehensive land use plan mentions a living document. Uh, we'll have regular updates to it. Uh, grant opportunities, this is uh, talking a bit more about the $1.8 million grant. It's a partnership between us and uh, LJB, who are one of our engineering firms. We have two engineering firms that we work with regularly for all of our infrastructure projects, Choice One and uh, LJB. Between the two, those two firms, we cover our engineering needs and we also tap into their grant writing uh, and expertise that they have. So the $1.8 million is a direct result of those partnerships. And we're pursuing other funding opportunities. I uh, mentioned to the council a couple weeks ago that we were able to secure the uh, almost $500,000 to reroute the storm system behind Dayton Street. That's been an issue for oh, for 60 years. Uh, we finally got some money to reroute that storm system. So. Um, we couldn't do these things without our, our partners, LJB and Choice One, because they provide the engineering, the technical expertise for us to secure these funding opportunities. All right, public works. We implemented an iWork system. Who here has uh, used the iWork system? Okay, please go <laughs> online. The iWork system is an app. So it's an app one, you put it on your phone, or you can access it on our website. You can upload uh, requests. Requests for, it could be anything from grinding sidewalks or overgrown bushes, anything that is not a, an emergency. We want folks using the system because one of the challenges I have is that <coughs> folks contact me after speaking to someone on the phone. They don't remember who it was, but they said, hey, I told this person about this trip hazard on some, on some street. Well, we didn't have a, a methodology. We didn't have a way of tracking those requests and figuring out what's going on. When did it get submitted? What, what was the resolution? What resources did it take? Well, now with the iWork system, I have access to it. So I know what my team's doing. So if somebody submitted a request and, they, and I need to follow up on it, I can go into the system and see if it's done or not. And if it was done, what was the resolution? And it allows us to keep track of improvements that we make. 
our iWork system is also tied into a mapping system that we have. We are we are mapping our power poles or maintenance poles or transformers or lines or water taps or sewer taps, water meters. We're 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 GISing every asset that we have in our system. So as we're doing work on these projects, we put notes into our iWork system. So the next person that comes behind and works on the same thing, they can see what others have done. Mm -hmm. We have heard horror stories of people saying they did one thing, but we dig up a hole of look to see what's on the ground. It's a completely different thing. One, uh, give you an example, the water line that's connected on cemeteries, cheap. the map showed that it was a four inch. Well, when we dug it up, it was two one inch lines being connected to a four inch line. And the record says that it was a continuous four inch line. But we dug up, and that wasn't the case. So, you know, that's troubling to find these things. Um, that's what you need to a lot of our problems. So, that's why iWorks is important as we're making improvements to our system or documenting it. And so, we got the record of them. We can find any trends and troubleshoot issues before we dig something up. We also got a lot of awards last year. Um, one of our, our, our most prestigious award, we got the AMP Innovation Award. And that was for the integration of the iWork system with the GIS system. So we could, we, the, the two systems communicate with each other and we're able to make notations on the assets. So if we replace the transformer, we did some work on the transformer, it would be noted and the next technician could see the history of work on any asset that we have in the system. We also got the public the safety award, which is it's an important for us because that means that no one got hurt on the job. Mm -hmm. Electric department, we completed the streetscape that's installing 13 new lights at the John Bryan Center. Uh, we replaced uh, all uh, priority reject poles that were found in an audit in 2015. So we did that in 2019, that's 32 poles replaced by our team and 40 poles replaced by, con sorry, 10 poles replaced by contractors. So that's a total of 42. We have a goal for 2021 to replace 44 poles. Mm -hmm. uh, we are on target to do that. We are hitting, we have to make a decision at the end of the month um, on whether we want to replace all 44 poles or redirect funds to take care of poles on South Walnut Street. You know, familiar here with the poles on South Walnut, they're leaning. <laughs> so we didn't have those uh, in the proposal for this year, so they're leaning, we need to replace them. And the reason they're leaning is because there's limestone beneath them, so we can uh, put them in too deep. So that's part of the problem. So a solution that the engineers have come up with is just don't do power poles on that South Walnut side, just underground everything and do extend the street landscape. Um, project. The challenge with that is that that costs more money. So if we use all our power pole replacement money to do that upgrade, we won't have money to do the additional pole replacements uh, for the rest of the year. So those are the challenges that we have to weigh. And you replace the poles, so we replace them, in a couple of years they'll be leaning over again. <laughs> so we have to make a decision um, about that at the end of the month. Water department, we had some issues with wells two and five, so we had to re-sleeve the wells. The, the wells have a, have a cylinder all the way down to the aquifer, and they were damaged, so we needed to uh, repair them. Uh, we also replaced H water lines, the wells, uh, including water main feeding cemetery street. That's the project I mentioned that there was a water issue happening, and we dug it up, and there were two one-inch lines when it should have been a four-inch water line. So we had to replace that. And uh, we did some uh, hydrant flushing of the system and replaced five uh, hydrants. Other big thing was we, you guys heard of energy, biosolids problem in the township, uh, Bath Township. So we needed to solve that sludge disposal issue. Uh, we have uh, permits to do a land application of our biosolids out in Miami Township. Uh, we can just dump it on farmland and get it tilled into the soil. 
I think our township uh, neighbors might not be pleased with that. I see Chris <laughs> raising eyebrows. So we did not do that. What we did is we um, enhanced our relationship with Bryan County Landfill. Bryan County Landfill is also a, a landfill that produces energy. And we have a contract with them. So we uh, arranged a contract where we would take our bottle solids to Brown County Landfill. Uh, so that would increase our transportation cost. So we need to figure out, okay, how do we also do this in an economical way? Because it's a lot of truckloads to, to send uh, to Brown County. So we implemented a water presser, a machine that presses the sludge. So we pour water through it and presses the water out. So it removes the water from the biosolids and we are then transporting biosolids as concentrated as we can get them and not water. So that's a way that we were able to move away from energy and, and do it in a cost-effective way. It still costs us more money than energy. It costs us over $10,000 more a year. Uh, but we found that that was a, uh, an adequate solution in solving the public crisis, if you will, the PR crisis that exists in the township and Bath Township. And, uh, I think we're also being sensitive to our neighbors. So we also installed a back truck for a dumping station so that we could uh, suck up debris and, and, and wastewater out of the maintenance holes and have a place to dump it. We didn't have that uh, function. Uh, we do now. So we're able to take care of more work in house. That's the presser right there, that machine there. Um, I don't have any, any footage to show you how uh, in, in operation, but presses the water out of the biosolids, reduces the, the weight of what we transport in Brown County. And that right there, that's Brad, and those are <laughs> tomato plants. We uh, pressed, uh, we did a, a, a one of our first runs of pressing solids. Uh, we pressed it and just put it out there on the, on the concrete pad to let it dry so that it, the weight would um, be reduced. And so we then load it to a dump truck and send it off to Brown County. And while it was drying, it, the tomato plants. <laughs> tomatoes on them. Amazing, right? And a lot of nutrients in that. <laughs> a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> tomato All right, wastewater update. Uh, so this is a uh, big news. And in 2019, the date on here, this is a letter from the EPA, June 11th of 2019. This letter was sitting on my desk unopened when I joined the team on June 17th. So it was unopened. I opened it. And in it, it said, hey, you're exceeding your, your daily flows. Our plant is built for 600,000 uh, gallons per day. We're exceeding those, uh, those flows, average flows. So this is the EPA, the Ohio EPA telling us, you can't build more. You're exceeding your daily flows. So at the time, they got wind that, uh, I don't know where they heard this number. Uh, home, they thought that Home Inc. was looking to build a 500-person facility right behind this building. I don't know where they, where they got that information, but they, they pointed it out to us that said, you can't do this, you're, you're exceeding your, your daily flows. Um, not, not, not the letter that you want waiting for you on your first day on the job. <laughs> so, but we knew that this was urgent, and so we tackled it in 2019 and 2020. And the news to report, this is our, our daily flows here. We were averaging 657,000 uh, gallons per day. Um, not only were we exceeding them, we actually had violations. We had an uh, uh, effluent violation and bypasses. We have a bypass system that big storms come through. It's coming at a greater rate than what our plant can store and process. So we have a dumping site that takes uh, over 5 million gallons. It's uh, a pond. And so we dump it in there and then we pull it into the treatment plant to process it. So we did have violations then. We were having violations, uh, so we knew it was a big problem. We fixed it. We reduced, uh, we reduced our water being processed by 60%. And we did that by reducing the infiltration and inflow coming into the system. Uh, the work that entailed, some of it was very basic. I, I think Jerry and I had a conversation of, uh, on the number of studies that Yellow Springs as a government has had over the years. And I ran a, a, a query on their accounting system. I, I typed in the word study, and I looked at all the POs that popped up, and there were over $200,000 in studies, and many of which 
sit on the shelf. So the way we solved this issue was by pulling a report that sat on the shelf. There's a, a, a report commission in 2012 that outlined what were some of the infiltration and infill issues. Some of it was covers, main and pole covers. They were too porous. Some of them were below grade, below ground, and they needed to be raised. And there were adapter kits that you could just mount on top, raise it a few inches, and keep stormwater out of it. And there was some actual sewer work that needed to be done. Uh, Maintenance hole, re, um, redoing the, the concrete around them, replacing uh, some section, some joints, and relining. So that's how we were able to reduce it by 60%. So this is the totals for this is looking at water produced and wastewater uh, reclaimed. So in the data that we have, we went back to 2018, we were producing 102 million gallons of water and we were collecting back 228 million gallons of water. And that just doesn't work, right? If you're putting out 100 million gallons of water, you're expecting less than 100 million coming back because people drink the water too mm -hmm. or they use it for watering their plants or whatever it is. But we were collecting 222% of the water we put out. 2018, 2019, that number went down a bit, down to 188. And then in 2020, we got it down to 125%. So it's still more water than we put out. So we know we have infiltration in the loading system. Um, but it's not the 223 that we were getting. So this is uh, the the reclaim averages, this is your uh, the, the daily flow averages. So in, in 2018, we went from 626, 626,000 to 651,000 and down to uh, 493. So we got a little over 100,000 gallons of uh, capacity there. So that's going to allow for um, additional construction. So. The over development, I know for many folks, they were concerned about our infrastructure. Can our infrastructure handle it? Our sewer system can, our water system can, our electric system can. So we have capacity. This is water that we produce versus water that gets built. This is a sad story because um, we have a lot of water that goes on the ocean. We don't know where it goes. We just can't track it. So when we did this year, um, there are two properties that we wanted to make sure that we put a meter in. The veil has a new meter and a new line, so we're tracking that water, um, something we couldn't do previously. And the Thunderbird farm has uh, a meter. Um, there's some arrangements there that precede me, and you know, it's long. Some arrangements made a long time ago that we're trying to work through. Uh, so that we could make sure we have meters everywhere we need to have meters. So we, the, the point here is that we have a lot of water losses that we're not, we're not getting paid for. We're putting out, and we're not sure it's even going to a customer. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a, a, a contractor uh, do sonar testing of our water lines. There's new technology out there that can send a sound signal into the ground it can detect water pipes and water running underneath it. So what we're looking for are water leaks. We did a, we did a test uh, uh, a little over a month ago behind Dollar General, and we found what we believe is an underground stream uh, going into our, one of our sanitary lines, just water flowing. And we know there's no underwater stream there. Uh, so we suspect a water line is leaking and the water is getting right back into our sanitary system. So we're just losing the water. So uh, we expect to have a better understanding of what our leakage is in our system. And from there, we'll make a plan to address the, the leakage. Mm -hmm. so that's for 2020, over 40%, over 46% of the water, uh, we have a, that's our water loss. So about half of the water we produce is getting built for. Mm -hmm. So I know for, for folks that are sensitive about utilities, uh, we have one of the highest water rates uh, in our area, um, so we know that's an issue. The big cost drivers there are personnel and debt service. <coughs> it's expensive to pay for a new plant, and we're going to be paying for it for many years, but having such a high water loss doesn't help either. Uh, 
Um, all right, street departments. These guys are responsible for maintaining 30 miles of roads and 25 miles of sanitary sewers um, and over 10 miles of storm system. Um, they maintain over 600 um, new manholes. We had a lot of utility locates, 800, uh, 605. Uh, these catch basins, this is one of the ways we reduce the uh, infiltration and inflow is we reduce catch, uh, sorry, we raise six catch basins. There were below, below grade, so a lot of storm water just uh, uh, goes into them. We have another 21 catch basins to replace three. We installed new uh, bike racks at, at John Bryan Center. This was a partnership with the Youth Welding Program at the Career Center. So we got these nice yellow bike racks with the uh, We did a lot of root control. We did a root control in 6,000 feet of sewer systems. That's, we have clay systems, uh, clay uh, pipe center system in, in sections of town, and roots have penetrated them. So we do, uh, we uh, hire a contractor who's got this foam technology that's able to spray foam into the sewers, and that dissolves the roots in the sewer system. So we jetted 20,000 feet of uh, sanitary lines. We had an issue a couple of weeks ago. Where these guys have tasked the, the team to, this mic is on, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. um, I've tasked the team to routinely jet sanitary lines because they create, if we don't clear these lines, they create backup. They clog up the system and create backflow in, in, uh, in, in homes. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had an issue where someone jetted too close to uh, to uh, someone's home, and it splashed up up into their toilet. So it happens when you hear some gargling or noises coming out of the toilets. But know that my team is out there jetting uh, system so we can maintain uh, clear sanitary lines. So, uh, oh, we did. Uh, Video recorded and inspected 15,000 feet of sanitary lines. We actually just completed this year's project of video inspections. And we're, over the next couple weeks, we'll review the video and photographs of sanitary systems and we'll make a decision of what lines we will be on for 2021. All right, police department. Busy police department, over 100, 920 social service encounters. Uh, Florence leads the assistance for families. She coordinated over $78,000 in assistance to stabilize families. Some of that's food, rent. Uh, the township also contributed a lot of its CARES money to providing uh, rental assistance. Um, we have a chaplain's program. That's, uh, we have a team of volunteers that we can dispatch in the case of traumatic incidents, death, or significant injury. Uh, we've continued youth engagement and mentoring program during COVID-19. I uh, think you all know that we opened our center while the schools were closed. We had a, a learning center in the building by appointment only and a limited number of participants. So we've been, we'd, that was a new program for 2019. We felt the, the urgency and obligation to provide some resources for our, our children. The school couldn't do it. Um, we had to do it because we know a lot of the situation and the families in our community poor families, neglect, and so we need to provide uh, opportunities for our children. So that's why we opened our center. Uh, that's also part of the reason why we opened the pool. There was a, some controversy about us opening the pool. There was a petition to keep the pool closed. We just couldn't do it. We, just, we, we were up to date on the science that we could open a pool safely outdoors. Uh, we were able to do it. We did it. I think I put my job on the line and I, might have not been the first uh, village manager to put the line and their job on the line due to the pool issue. Um, so we had a lot of youth engagement. Uh, we also did implicit bias training for all police officers. So all of our police officers are trained, have implicit bias training. They are, they are also trained in critical incident uh, uh, training, so they, they know how to respond to mental emergency, mental health emergencies and other situations. We launched the bike patrol and we improved our records management and data repair. Those are the breakout of the numbers. Finances, this is fresh from the auditor's uh, report. We completed our audit. Um, 
our audit was due in May, we've completed that. The state has reviewed it and has signed off. So the numbers here on this sheet are audited. Uh, <laughs> last year I had a big breakout of every department and how we did and Don uh, had something to say about it. At the end I put all the cash, all the cash together. Uh, I still put all the cash together, Don, for this report, but I want you guys to know when you look at the cash position, that's not the general fund, that's the total cash that we have for the general fund, special revenue fund, and enterprises. We're not commingling with the funds, but we're just reporting them together and they're all in their separated accounts. All right, the big takeaways from here on the revenue. The top is the revenue. What, were we, what did we budget and what did we actually receive? So for the general fund, we budgeted 3.7 million uh, in revenue. We received 3.4. And this is after we modified our budget. So we modified our budget around June. We did a reduction. So the 3.7 million is a reduction to what we expected. And the reduction was due to COVID. We knew we were going to have a hit on our income tax. So even with a conservative uh, budgeting, we still had a loss of 344,000. Uh, revenues for a general fund. Our special revenue funds, we did a little better, 386,000. Uh, so we collected more than we budgeted. Our enterprise funds did well. We collected a million dollars uh, more than what we expected. A little over half of that is due to uh, the sale of our racks. We sold our racks last year, um, which were around 500,000. And we bought the same amount of RECs that we sold. RECs are renewable energy credits, so over 70% of portfolio are, uh, of energy, energy portfolio is renewable energy, and uh, those contracts, we get uh, renewable energy credits. And last year we sold them. Uh, we sold our compliance uh, utility credits, and we bought credits in a cheaper market. So we still have the same number of credits we generated in 2019. Uh, sorry, in 2020, um, uh, so we still have the same number of credits. We just sold what we had and bought back cheaper rents. Uh, on the expenses, with COVID, we're also sensitive what we spend in life. So if we didn't need to spend it, we didn't spend it. On the general fund, we had appropriation authority to spend 4.9, and we spent 3.4. So we cut our expenses by uh, $1.4 million. Mm -hmm. On special revenue, we had budget authority to spend 1.2 million. We spent 1 million, 1 million 78,000 to be exact. We saved 183,000. Capital projects, we also cut our projects. In enterprise funds, we had authority to spend 10 million. We spent uh, 9 million, so that was a net savings of 9 million, and, uh, sorry, 975,000. So overall, we're looking at Two point, almost 2.7 million in savings from what we had budgeted to spend. So we're um, frugal, if you will, in 2020. I'm sorry, that header should not say the police department. That's, I don't know why that still stayed on it. Equity and cash, our total cash position, um, and this is audited. Uh, for December 31st, we were at 9,850,000. So you'll see our cash position over the years from 2014 to 2021. Uh, we've been growing that cash position. So financially, we're we're doing well. We're doing well, and that's despite the fact that we have continued to dip into our reserves to fund capital improvements. So we also did analysis of return on cash assets uh, in 2019 when I came on board. We changed our investment strategy. We had a lot of cash sitting on, sitting in checking accounts that were not earning anything. So we're basically lending uh, money to the bank because you know they're using it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we changed our investment strategy and put everything above our 90-day reserve into an investment account. That's Star Ohio, Star Plus, and we also open money market accounts with uh, West West Banco and. Uh, we did very well in 2019 and in part of 2020. 2021, that's a partial year, um, but the, we have limitations on what we could do with our investments. They have to preserve capital. We can't take risk with our taxpayer money. So we are limited to investing in CDs and bonds that are secure. So we don't 
we're not going to have significant or great performance in 2021 because bond market and CD markets are very low. All right, strategy. Our strategy for 2021 is based on the village's uh, goals. So I hope you've seen this sheet before. This is from council. And so I try and align our activities, our administrative activities uh, strategy to what council has uh, adopted as goals. So that's council's goal. Uh, establish and begin the municipal broadband enterprise services. That's the top of my list. Um, just recently, we secured $300,000 from Broadband Ohio to launch our pilot project, uh, Fiber to the Home. That $300,000 will allow us to connect up to 300 homes and businesses to fiber. That's much better in a connection than anything is in town. In fact, what we have downtown, the wireless downtown, that provides faster speed than what residents are getting in the neighborhoods, that Wi-Fi signal. Uh, so we hope to bring one gigabit internet connection to so 300 homes uh, by the fall. That would allow us to establish a revenue stream, which we can use that financial data to pursue uh, revenue uh, bond financing to build out the rest of the network. We've done uh, performance for the broadband network, the municipal broadband network, and it is financially sustainable. In fact, it's, it would make money uh, over a 20-year period. So got a good data on that. Reduced water loss. Um, water loss in 2020 was uh, over that 36%. We're looking to reduce those losses. Uh, we're prioritizing that work because, you know, I don't know if you know this, but for 2021, we did not do a water raise, uh, sorry, a water rate increase. We wanted to, to have a bad handle of what's happening in the water department and, and water losses before we propose the rate changes. So we want to hold the current rate that we have now for as long as we can. And the way that we believe we'll be able to do that is by managing the loss. So water loss, uh, it's a major priority for us. Yeah, designed and installed up to 2.25 megawatt solar project. That includes a solar pavilion. You guys see the nice drawing of the solar pavilion as a newspaper, there's a couple months. So that's part of our, our energy strategy. We have two big contracts that are expiring, one in 2021 and one in 22. And that allows us, well, we need to fill in the gap for over two megawatts of power in our system. So we want to build that locally. I think our community, despite what's happening in Kingwood Solar, I think our community wants more solar uh, here in the village. So we're looking at Sun Farm and uh, building solar on Sun Farm and building the solar pavilion. I believe about a month and a half ago, um, we, we had our, our partner at American Municipal Power provide an update to council. And we also asked them to give us proposals on replacing the two contracts that are expiring. And they did. And those the proposals to replace those two contracts are very, are, are, are very good. One of them, the solar project, will be a two cent kilowatt hour project. That's very competitive. We've been in conversation with a few um, utility-grade uh, solar companies, and they can't deliver that. So we'll put in our put an RFP in a, in a month or two to see if we can get better rates on building out solar. But that's the intention: is that we want to look at building two point uh, uh, two five or two and a half megawatt solar system in the building. And we we'll, we'll need to do it in a financially sustainable way. It needs to be a, at a competitor rate. Continue the Safe Us to School project. Yesterday I did a walkthrough on uh, limestone. We had our uh, surveyors mark the lines of what the sidewalk, where the sidewalk will go uh, along limestone. This would allow connection to the school, from the school up to Bill Duncan Park sidewalk. Uh, some neighbors are upset that we're taking away their parking and their garden. So we had our surveyor, so our surveyors come out and mark the property and so they know where the public right away is. What's the people's property and what's their private property. So we just recently uh, marked that. I know Karen's uh, house is on that. Um, Karen's been very supportive of the sidewalk project. Absolutely, I think it's an important um, process. So we'll finally get that done. So construction will begin next year for that. 
and we'll continue our sanitary sewer improvements. Um, we want to. I think we're in a good place with our sewer system. We about have over 100,000 gallons of daily flow capacity. Uh, we can we can improve it. We can get it better. So we'll continue that work um, and cut costs. File digitiz digitization and catalog of records. We have got a grant from the Ohio Archive uh, Association uh, that paid for fancy scanners and software for us to digitize all the records. So that's underway. At the end of the year, we'll have. Uh, Council uh, minutes and ordinances up online. We're updating the personnel policy manual. Um, it's outdated it's from 2014, and there's some things in it that are not up to legal standards now. So we need to bring it up to code. And while we're updating it, we also want to adapt it to support uh, our ambitious strategy and. and uh, be the right personnel manual that we want. Part of it is, as you know, we've worked on police issues. We updated our evaluation tool uh, for police uh, officers. So we also need to make updates on performance management, performance evaluation, and the personnel manual. So the two, the evaluation tool and the personnel manual line up so that we can have a police force that uh, meets the expectations of our community and its values and we have the right fit. Reroute the Dayton store, uh, storm water system. We got that uh, five hundred thousand dollars to do that. Uh, while we're at it, we need to put an infrastructure on the railroad property, that railroad lot. Um, right now, what keeps that lot from being developable, uh, having any development projects on there, is that there's a storm system that runs underneath it. So we can't put anything in it, uh, on top of it. So if we reroute the storm system, reroute the utilities leave uh, utilities underground uh, so they were allowed for development on it. We think that's a long-term strategy, it's forward-looking. So that way we can market the railroad lot um, for something that can go on there. In order for us to imagine what kind of utilities we would need on the site, what kind of infrastructure, we need to think of a uh, concept. So the concept that I'm thinking for railroad lot is a three-story building with retail space on the first floor, uh, professional offices on the second floor and residential on the third floor. So we need to engineer utilities and infrastructure for what demand will be of, uh, of such a building. Uh, we need to update our masters, uh, sorry, our Parks and Recs master plan. Our current version is from uh, 1998. Annabelle, I think you would like that. It's an mm -hmm. old document. Now we still have been working on Parks and Recreation goals. Uh, uh, at this pond, we put uh, three bridges now. We've got the one over the spillway, a smaller bridge off to the right, and we've got a bridge connecting back to the operating. So we've uh, improved the safety of Ellis Pond. And we've done other things in other parks. And website updates. I hate our website. I hear from residents they can't find anything on our website. So we need to change it. And that's on the goals for 2021. Um, We'll continue to work with the Development Corporation. We're adopting government accounting standards. Uh, we want to we wanna be able to meet that GFOA award and standards. Uh, and we're not there. We have a lot of work uh, to do to get us there. But uh, we're slowly working at it. We're doing a rate study for water, sewer, and electric. Um, we had a paved parking feasibility study. I think council was very clear when they removed parking concepts from the comprehensive language plan. So I don't, I don't, this is not something that we're going to uh, pursue. Uh, Port Authority financing for infrastructure projects, they're, they're, we're, we're exploring uh, funding options uh, for infrastructure projects. So who will be water losses? If we're able to find all of our leaks, um, we don't have cash on hand to make such an infrastructure improvement to replace water lines and whatnot. We don't have the capital for it. But we do want to explore the options of seeking Port Authority money, lending money, if we're able to make the case that by doing this infrastructure, we'll generate cost savings, and could we take those cost savings and pay off the debt? So we'll explore opportunities like that if they make a financial sense for us to borrow money that would save us money, then I think it's a and good use of the lending um, of a credit. 
Safe Routes to School will continue the Safe Routes to School project. I mentioned we staked out that uh, sidewalk this, uh, just this week. Um, we'll get that built next year. And we have uh, the active transportation projects on for 2023. Uh, we'll continue our officers, uh, bike officers program. Doug's really good at it. I don't know if you guys seen our officers downtown or throughout the village and their bicycles. Uh, we've got climate action uh, plan. This, this was a topic of discussion at last at Monday's council meeting. Uh, my position on the climate action plan is that we are doing things now that are actions that typically come after some comprehensive planning process. You don't, you don't get to have a 70% renewable energy portfolio by accident. You, we, a renewable energy costs more. There's, it has to be done with intention. So from my perspective, a climate action plan would have been put together long before we embark on such ambitious goals of having so much renewable energy and doing all the other things that we do. We have a green belt, um, there's a lot of land conservation, uh, so our stormwater mitigation policies, we are now a wild habitat community. All these things would typically come out of some comprehensive planning process. So I think a climate action plan is long overdue uh, and it should be funded. So that's on, uh, on the works for this year. And alley maps and improvements. Last year we did a lot of alley improvements. We improved the alley behind Dollar General and one off Dane Street. So we want, we want folks to be able to use the alleyways. At least to get to the backyards. Uh -huh. if they want to walk through them even better. So we want to uh, make improvements to the alleys. And I think that's my presentation. Overdevelopment. My position over development. Um, over, once they acquire that land, they can build on it whether the village wants it or not. By right, they can build on it. If annexed into the village, by right, they get to build on it. So my position on it is we want a seat at the table because if we have a seat at the table and we have a voice on it, we could get them to move to a position that meets our community's goals. So that's been positioned from the beginning, and that's why I was eager to jump on the overdevelopment and get them that next into the village. Because once they bought it, they can build on it without anyone having to say on it, as long as they meet zoning and building code. And the township zoning code, as Richard knows very well, is very generous. They could build their, their big houses out there on big lots. So I think it's, it's uh, it's important for us to have a seat at the table and while they're building, they can help us meet housing goals and development goals. Um, we're gonna make some changes to the zoning code. It's part of the weeds ordinance already that uh, we consider the community land trust uh, model. Right now, the why this is up on our goals is, um, I got into some trouble for sending citations to Home Inc. for uh, weeds. Um, reason I had to send citations to the home name is because they are the property owner of record. So if you click on any parcel, any home name property, you look at who the owner is, it shows home name. Our, our laws and procedures say you're going to issue a citation that goes to the homeowner record. So I sent them, I followed the law, sent them a citation. That was a mistake. <laughs> it was. It was. And it was one because I think it created unnecessary stress on me and, and attention. I think there were ways to resolve it. And uh, we had the conversations. Those issues were resolved. But uh, I think that there is room to improve our zoning code by recognizing community land trust uh, model, ownership model where home Inc. or the community land trust owns the land and provides a 99 year lease. So we can recognize that ownership structure and still meet our uh, legal obligations to enforce zoning code. So we need to recognize that in our zoning code and issue the citations where it belongs. Um, and that is if, if the homeowner, in the case of community land trust, is, is the person who owns the dwelling, if they are contributing to a nuisance in the, co in the community, then they're responsible and not the owner of the land who's provided the 99-year lease. So, um, so for the time being, 
until the zoning code, the new zoning code gets adopted, we've got an internal process where we're sending citations to the homeowner, the dwelling, all that sits on top of the land that's owned by the community land trust. Uh, so that's why that's up there. We've got a utility improvement plan, um, cap, part of a capital improvement plan. We're constantly looking ways of how we can improve our systems with the funds that we have that will yield savings. We have uh, we have explored a stormwater management fee, as you know, with climate change. One of our challenges is dealing with stormwater. That, that's one of system one of the things that's affecting our sewer system, the infiltration and inflow. It's the stormwater management fee has become a common way of creating a revenue stream to put in stormwater mitigation uh, devices or, 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 or infrastructure. Um, it's something that we want to explore for the village. Right now, we do not have dedicated funds for stormwater management. And stormwater, ma stormwater is costing us a lot of money. So, uh, and finally, the dog park. We started construction. It's open, so we'll, we'll get that done this year. That's the end of my presentation. How am I doing on time, Don? We have half an hour. Okay. I'm going to sit over here so I can see people. I know you guys are taking notes and you got your Well, questions. actually, thank you. That was really good. That was really interesting. And um, actually, I'm not going to talk about Mills Lawn. Okay. Shocking. Except that I don't want this to happen on the North Lawn. But I, I've been thinking, I've read Strong Towns and uh, community development stuff a lot. I'm wondering, these are all just sort of floating around. But things like, it seems to me with the big outflow from California and uh, New York and all of that, have you thought about, instead of attracting jobs, attracting people? They will come with high income, because mm -hmm. they maybe have jobs with Apple and Google, and they can live wherever they want, and mixed housing for that kind of income level with affordable housing, and, and um, take advantage of that and develop um, amenities that this kind of person might might want, including green space, mm -hmm. but that's not all. Mm -hmm. So is there any is there any movement like that? Like that could go, like one thing that could help with that is broadband. You have money for a bike path. There could be like a housing development out, I don't know, somewhere out there by the pot farm and the school and with easy access to the village. Mm -hmm. So thinking about people more so than jobs to bring people. Uh, the short answer is yes. Now, I would separate the bringing the California, the Colorado people, um, because you know I know those states are having outflows of people. Mm -hmm. Now, so did Ohio. Ohio lost. Two uh, percent. Uh, Yes, and Jerry, you have a, Jerry has a wonderful presentation in the redistricting and part of the redistricting loss of of, uh, of a seat. Um, so the short answer is yes. Broadband is part of that uh, strategy. Being able to provide a, a an infrastructure or an access that would allow people to work anywhere. So they could bring those high paying Apple jobs or Google jobs here. They can come with that job. So providing an infrastructure. Broadband is key to that. I mentioned that broadband is like the interstate, right? It allow people to connect to jobs somewhere else, allow them to connect to their doctors. It's part of the economic development strategy. In terms of the housing, focusing on the housing, the over projects, not necessarily our project, but part of that development meets some of the things that you say. Um, I've had private conversation put over and looking at what is their, their clientele, what is their, their their customer. Some of that is Yellow Spring, current Yellow Springs residents that are looking to downside and will create housing opportunities in the village. And there's others that will be new residents from outside the community. So 
Short answer is yes, a lot of the work that we're doing, what we're doing with sewers, sewer systems, is not sexy conversation, but creating capacity in our sanitary system allows for more development. I have a question about that. Who is paying for the infrastructure to get to Ober? And who will maintain it? Ober will pay for it. We already have, they already pay, we already they already have water and sanitary system there. In fact, our sanitary source system writes right through the middle. It's right in the middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did I answer, did I, did I answer your question? Yeah, but I have more. Okay, all right. Richard? I just wanted to ask if, if I lived in Yellow Springs and worked from home for a uh, company in, in California, would I pay income tax on my income? You would pay the school income tax. On the the school, yes. Yes, I'm talking about the village. Currently, currently, you wouldn't pay us because your, your work address will probably be where that company right. uh, is located. The state is considering a policy that would allow us to tax uh, that individual is working yeah, from. I would say it's not, it, it doesn't necessarily benefit the village economically to bring in someone that works somewhere else. Well, it would certainly benefit the schools and benefits um, their property taxes. There are other ways that no, we no, no, are not directly by the village government taxing their income. But they could. We could. We, we could. And you know, one of the things that, I, that we've explored is the reciprocal tax issue. Henry Meyer has been one of the champions on this conversation, and the idea is that there are folks, there are residents, that people that live here in Yellow Springs, that work somewhere else, and they're paying taxes where they work. Because that's the state law: is you pay taxes where you work. So if they're working in Dayton, they're paying the two and a half percent income tax to Dayton, but they live here and they're utilizing services here, but they're not paying the income tax to the village government. So the reciprocal tax would allow us to be able to collect tax on those individuals that work somewhere else, paying taxes somewhere else, but are not paying taxes here. It seems to me, considering all of this, that it's businesses that are going to bring in a hell of a lot more tax money. And yeah, we can do the reciprocal and things like that, but I've calculated at one and a half percent. We need 666 jobs for people working in Yellow Springs to get another million dollars at $100,000 a job. And that isn't going to happen. Um, so we need the businesses here to provide much bigger things. What kind of efforts are in place to try and bring in more, more businesses? Mm -hmm. the, the, what money? the businesses is where yeah. we're going to have the, the revenue. In a lot of communities, roof, roofs, there's a saying that rooftops are losers. They, do, they cost more money to maintain than the money they bring in. Um, Can you say that again? That rooftops are losers. Mm -hmm. from, from an economic perspective. Housing rooftops. Yeah. Well, housing rooftops. Yeah. Housing rooftops. Um, in our community, we need both. We need both. We, 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 Cresco, I've had conversations with Cresco. They have people that want to live in town, but they can't find a place to live. They can't find a place that meets their budget. Uh, so we also need the housing to be able to attract the jobs. So we need a, a two-pronged approach here. We, if we want to bring the jobs that we want operating, we want the companies operating, we also have to provide the housing amenities that those companies and those employees want. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been a challenge what big corporations have to deal with. So what they resorted to is building their own housing stock. Big companies are then now building apartments and homes for their employees because the communities can't provide that. So we need, we need both. Can I, this isn't to, to discuss a topic, but is there a working group? I think there's a lot of interest in this. Does the economic development do this? I think a lot of us would have would like to have some input. Is there a group where you can discuss these things and try to have some input or advice? There are several groups and, and spaces that we can have this conversation. The McKee Association is one of them. The Yellow Springs Development Corporation is another. Um, I know I have my council is another one. We have conversations with council. The building department is, is part of that economic development strategy. Um, one of the things that I've come to, to realize is if we, want a better, if we want to be more successful with economic development, we have to have a streamlined process for building permits from the person who is illiterate to the building code to the most savvy of building construction companies. 
we need to have a department that works for folks all across the spectrum. I want I want a building department that the person who knows the least about building code and probably doesn't need architectural drawings can come in to an office and say, I need a deck permit, what I need to do, and that person can draw their their deck design and have it go through the system. They don't need to hire some structural engineer to stamp it. So at the, the building department, those conversations are being held at council. That's another uh, avenue to have those discussions. Is there a citizen group? Uh, is there a citizen group? Well, all those, certainly council has input, uh, has uh, uh, platforms for citizens. I have a development, uh, I have a housing advisory board that citizens come to, and we have representatives from citizens. Um, so we're getting citizen input uh, through that group. I don't know if others, if I miss anything, Don, did I miss anything? Your township meetings are open. Well, I will say that the next community conversation uh, 20, well, I'll come up with a date. Uh, we have the topic of a panel of new businesses in town, uh, but I can't tell you who's on the panel. It's not settled. The other one that Don, I know Don and I spoke when actually at the groundbreaking of, of this fire station. He said, Don, Don, I don't know, one of us brought up the issue of taxes. And I said, yeah, let's, we need to talk about taxes. We have three big taxing agencies. The schools, followed by Green County, and then it's the village government. The village government gets less than 14% of the tax. We're the lowest. A township also gets money for fire services, but I think you guys know that that's great value. Colin and his team, great value. We need to have a conversation about taxes. Who are, who are all the taxing agencies, and what do we get, and what is the service that we provide them? We need to have a frank conversation. I think one of the challenges that I have with the limited property tax and income tax that we have is that our residents expect first-class service. They expect it, they demand it, and we don't have a budget for it. So we need to have a conversation with what folks are, are paying for and what is the expectation. Um, not just for our, our agency, our local government, but also the other taxing agencies. I think with the county, Paul, if you recording, you can send this to the commissioners and Brandon. The county knows that we can't do anything about uh, county taxes. We can. That's they. They get what they get, and they get it across all the municipalities, and they get sales tax. And you can get the greatest service or the worst service. So then, there's minimal impact that we can have on it. So I encourage you to stay connected with the commissioners and and advocate for Yellow Springs because we're so small, we're not going to get uh, leftovers or get left out of the conversations. Mm -hmm. All right, Kelly and. So I'm, on your programming, you showed that the parking was removed from the development plan. So is there anything that we're addressing about future parking issues? Not in the near future. I know that we, I know that we have a parking problem. But when council takes action to say we're removing all parking plans out of the comp plan, out of the comprehensive land use plan, mm -hmm. they, they made a decision that parking was not important because it was removed from parking uh, from the comprehensive land use plan. So what authority do I have to go around council and work on parking? No, but, but when you look at, so then we have developers who are coming in, like mm -hmm. Mr. Chappelle, yes. who's planning on us having um, venues that'll bring in additional people who are gonna require parking. Mm -hmm. So then when that happens, I mean, is there at that what what point do we relook at that again? You know, and saying, okay, well now we have additional you know development that's going to create even more substantial issues yes. with that. So there's two ways to deal with that. One is council thought that parking wasn't an issue because they removed the plans. Then let's review parking minimums. Let's eliminate parking minimums. You, you didn't see it an issue enough to want to focus uh, parking strategies in the comprehensive land use plan, so let's just get rid of it. Let's eliminate the parking minimums because 
People may not realize what you mean by parking minimums. Sorry, the zoning code uh, dictates parking minimums for development. So the, you, the project that you mentioned, any development project happens on a lot. The zoning code requires parking spaces per occupancy. Depending on the number of people that are going to be using that space, there has to be a, 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 an allocation of parking spaces that are devoted to that space. The fire station is a good example. A fire station doesn't matter what you put on there. You can't get parking out of it. There's no, it's only four parking spaces on the lot and two on the side of the building. That's six parking spaces. So anything that goes into the fire station will require additional parking based on the zoning code. But there's no way to get it. There's no way for a developer or any project to get additional parking out of that. There's nowhere else to go. Uh, so let's eliminate the, the parking requirements and the, the parking minimum requirements in all of the downtown because there isn't a feasible way that any developer could park parking downtown. There just isn't space. But then if you take railroad street property and develop it, you've just eliminated a whole bunch more parking. Yes. And now you know that parking, we added that. I, we, yeah. It's been during my time that we added parking on rare lot. Railroad lot, and we added the 27 parking spaces on the, at the John Bryan, the, the course. And, so and all of that's used, isn't it? All of that is used. All of that is used. All of that is used. So, so to your first, your, there's two parts to my answer to your question. One is let's eliminate let's eliminate parking minimum requirements for all development in the downtown area, and two, let's be flexible about parking plans. If someone can make an arrangement with an adjacent property owner or or some other empty space for parking, for special event, whatever the parking requirement would be, let's be flexible to parking plans. By eliminating minimum parking requirements downtown, you're taking away the supply side of the equation. The demand side, we stimulate by attracting people to the community. So there seems to be a tad imbalance in that philosophy. But we already did that by saying parking is not is, is not important that we're going to remove it as a company, right? We said we so didn't say that. Council did. In their infinite wisdom, council said that. So the supply they supply they punted the problem. They didn't address the problem. So I, I don't know what answer you there, uh, Jerry. <laughs> Yes, supply, the yeah. supply demand curve is being manipulated here and it's not being done by the market, it's being done by uh, regulators. About... Oh, I'm sorry, I've got, I've got this gentleman over oh. here and then I've got <coughs> Carol and then I'm about. Back to taxes. Okay. In the next three to five years, do you, uh, is there a document or something that shows probable projects that you might be coming to the citizens of Yellow Springs to help fund through additional taxes that as we make decisions voting on things in the near future that is important to us to understand what our total, you know what our income budget is, but we don't know what our tax expectation is. And is there some way that we can get a hold of a broader possible projection of, gee, in the next three to five years I see this or I see this, mm -hmm. that we can make more of an educated guess. We can't put up our money in a new mortgage when the kids are going to need braces. Right. And we're talking about mortgage, and then, well, gee, we need to think about other things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll go back to this conversation that said we need to have a conference. We need to talk about taxes. We need to talk about everyone's taxes. Because I don't currently have plans of a, a, a levy a tax, a property tax levy. I have ideas of what needs to be funded by property taxes, parks and recs. I think we have so much parks and recreation activities we don't have dedicated funds for parks and recs. Our parks and recs are funded through the general fund. It is a common practice in communities to have a parks and recs levy, money that's dedicated to parks and recreation, a streets levy, maintaining roads, and we don't have that. Right now we just have uh, a, a operating levy 
that fund, the general fund, and from there we fund everything else. So I think it will be important to have these levies for parks and recreation, possibly streets. Um, but right now I don't have any support in the council. No one in council wants to uh, champion a, a tax increase. So I also recognize that while I would want more property taxes, I've got two other taxing agencies that are ahead of me, right. the county and the schools, right. and anything I want to do, I have to demonstrate my value against these two other agencies or four agencies that already have a significant tax burden. So I would love to be in a room with the four taxing agencies that are relevant, that is the schools, the county, us, and the townships. The township are a part of it, and I, you know, I think the township do a great job for the service they provide us. The fire, sure. the, well, not a fire station. That's how long is that in <laughs> um, But for us to make decisions on taxing, so you, you understand my question, Dad. I'm, i got some. I got a decision to make at some point on a pretty big investment here in the village. But I also know that there's a value in infrastructure and other things that my vote is going to be important and I'd like it to consider the probability of other things of value that's not being talked about yet. Yes. I, and, and I'm disappointed that there's, I'm looking for a champion to help to bring that in a timely way mm -hmm. so that we can, if we so desire, think to allocate or vote in a way that allocates for probable other important issues. And I would like to say that I would love that too. Um, but in order to answer your question, I have to have these three other entities at the table and to agree to what taxes look like for the next 15, 20 years. What do we want to talk about? Like how long do we want to project taxes? Um, what I have in, in our office is I have um, everyone else's tax levy. So I know when the emergency levy one or two for the school come off and you know what's the tax burden for them for over the next 10, 15 years. So I know that information, but there is a decision in the information decisions for me there. I don't make those decisions and I also am not privy to the <coughs> conversations that the schools or the well not the, the county isn't having much conversation about taxes. They want their big jail and that's gonna be a sales tax issue. They don't have anything else. Um, I'm not aware that the township has any interest in raising tax. I think that's been the mantra for the township is how do we do our work without increasing any taxes? Um, so I, I don't, other than the nice building that we, we now have and we'll be paying for for some time, I don't know that there's any other activity there. Um, I'm not giving you a straight answer because I don't have a straight answer. Well, I, I think we uh, maybe put him at ease uh, yeah. to consider that the village property tax is a very small part of the overall tax burden for people yes. who live in Yellow Springs and the school district. And, and any increase, we would be a small percentage of that. But still, I think, not affect your personal financial decisions very much. Think yeah. about the school over there. Yeah, that's for sure. Where we're uh, for sure. We are less than 10, than 14 percent of your tax bill. And you get it. When you get your tax bill, it shows where the little sliver of that pie. But still, there's big things of infrastructure and energy grid and things yeah. like this that is important. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Well, I can tax assure tax. you I, when he floats a, a parks and recs. A levy and a street levy, he will reduce the general fund levy. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. We do have a question. <laughs> we got a couple. Jerry, we'll have a, the citizens get to review that every five years. <laughs> every five years. A couple it's people not like a levy that it goes on for 20 years. So we're running out of time, and there are a couple people who haven't okay. got their question in. I wanted to ask about, I keep thinking about village resources. We're talking about parking, we're talking about all kinds of needs. We have some resources that I don't see being used. What's happened to the Vernay property? There's a big, huge piece of land. The former Rabbit Run farm is right next to it. Nothing is happening there. Yes. We wow. can't waste that. 
One, because, well, we don't own it, and Bernay doesn't have any interest in doing anything with it. I, have, I spoke with Ed, the president and CEO of Bernay, um, late 20, 2019 and in 2020, as we were working through the uh, final remediation plan, the statement of basis. I, I made a pitch to Ed. I said, Ed, how do we acquire the property? Because it would be great for parking and great for solar. Oh and, and Ed says, sounds great, very interested. Let's talk after the statement of basis and the final remediation plan has been completed. So the, Renee, from my conversation with the president, they're interested in exploring opportunities, but they don't want to do anything until the US EPA has signed off on their final remediation plan. Which is expected Which I, I had a, a meeting with the uh, US EPA two weeks ago, and they said the statement of basis, which is the final remediation plan, has been drafted, uh, it's prepared, it's under legal review, and another six weeks it will be released. Um, so we may, be have, we may have a, a public meeting with the citizens to talk about the final remediation um, around se August, September. Now, I want to put this in perspective. I've been at this since 2019 I came on board. The Bernay contamination has gone on for 20 years. And in just the last two years, we had soil testing done around our utilities because we have water running through that property. And one of the concerns I had was what happens if we have a main break? Any engineers in the room, Jerry, you engineer? So what happens if that water main breaks? Uh, if that main breaks? It's going to suck in contaminants. And it could uh, contaminate our water source. So I asked them, I want to know exactly what's around the utilities once the level of contamination. Something that hadn't been done before, they did it. And with US EPA, we ruled out uh, the contamination, uh, well, not ruled out, but there would be contamination. But what kind of contamination would be if there was a water main break? So we got the data on that. We also mapped out our valves. So if there ever is a, a break on, on the water lines around that property, we know exactly what we need to turn off and turn on so that we can reroute water and limit the contamination to the water system. We also did that for electrical poles. Um, so we, we've done a lot of work with them. We also did the 3D modeling of the aquifers. We were able to rule out the, the contamination into our aquifers. So uh, I think Mitzi has been very involved with what's happening on that property. There's two aquifers in that, in that underneath the remake the upper aquifer is contaminated. The lower aquifer, where we draw our water from, is not contaminated. So our drinking water, our drinking water source is protected and hasn't been contaminated. So we have that satisfaction now, or well, we know that now, so that, that should alleviate concerns. Now, I wish that would have been a topic of discussion 20 years ago. It should have been 20 years ago when we found out that there was contamination there. So, gone on for 20 years, we've done a lot in the last two years, and we see, we see a lot of progress happening. Mm -hmm. We <coughs> will come to our time. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean we have to stop talking, but I see some folks have already left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Don, I don't know if we should wait a year to have a conversation about the village side. So Maybe we can get invited to another one. <laughs> On a narrower subject. Uh, yes. And <laughs> so talking about a narrow subject, what would you want to yeah, hear back on? What's economic development? I'm, I'm all about economic development, balancing economic development and affordable housing. And as part of that, developing a community that is very livable and that really is the, the what's happening I think in city design and, I, and, and it would make the village very attractive so I'm, I'm really interested in economic development what's too. the title of this event moving give me give me some time okay <laughs> Come on with the, come up with a title but that that's very interesting to me partly because we already have so many of the pieces 
we already are are poised to do that. I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> okay, but that's what but I. But we'll want. we'll follow up on it. July 28th is the fourth Wednesday of July, and I repeat, the topic is newer businesses in town, uh, and we will ask someone from the Chamber of Commerce uh, to join us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.